Walking and talking in Bethnal Green gives you an opportunity to explore a part of London which is one of the largest multicultural populations in the country. It is part of Tower Hamlets. Visit places of historical and heritage significance and you hear what some of the older residents have to say where they once lived and worked. My mum had one, two, three, four children and one died when she was a baby. If she had been alive now, she would have had tablets that would have kept her alive. So there was Sadie, Tommy, Rosie and myself, four of us left. My mum had to struggle to get food for us and everything and she used to work part-time as a um, French polisher, six days a week. Very poor, very poor. And she used to walk about a mile to her job each way. Life was rough. <laughs> we had two bedrooms in Burnham Estate, and three of us used to sleep together, all in one bed. I'm going to turn over now. <laughs> we'll all turn over <laughs> in bed. And uh, it was really rough. And bugs in the wallpaper. And we was in one room. Double bed and a single bed. Mm. The tragic event of the wartime period still casts a long, dark shadow over the lives of so many people. The Bethnal Green tube disaster happened on the evening of March the 3rd, 1943. It's one night I can really remember. The warning went about eight o'clock, just after eight o'clock, something like that, Mum said, right, gave a funny little nervous cough and said, right, my sister and I used to look at each other, she's going to tell us to get the bundles, and she did, and off we trekked, and we got round to the Aberdeen pub, and a, a bus had just left, which my mum wasn't at all happy about. Realised now, if we'd have got on that first bus, we'd have been killed, because we would have been right in it. Anyway, we got the other bus, got down to the tube. There was a queue of people, and you've got to realise it was absolutely pitch black because of the blackout. And it was a horrible, cold, damp night, so you couldn't even get any light from the moon, which was a good thing, because if you did, that was a bomber's moon, you'd have had the planes over. We were all just queuing up to go in and everyone talking to each other. And the searchlights went up, although there was no planes, but I can remember the searchlights. And then all of a sudden there was terrible noise. I can still hear it like hundreds of rockets going up in the air. It was awful, the noise. It went right through your ears. And as it went up, so they whistled like some of the bombs used to as they came down. That was when the pushing started, and because unbeknown to us, some poor woman at the bottom of the stairs, because there was 19 steps down, and then you come to this landing, and then you turned right into what is now the big booking hall. And it was this 19 steps, which had no handrail, and they were wooden steps, and they were slippery from the rain, because all you had was one little doorway into it, where a policeman used to stand, but he wasn't there for some reason that night. So this poor woman carrying a baby or a child had tripped at the bottom, had pulled another man with her, and everybody else, it was all going on top of her. They were evidently pulled high right to the ceiling on this landing and all the way back up the stairs. It's funny how people cope with everything. My dad went to work, my sisters went to work, I went to school. Um, the air raids was on sometimes, sometimes they wasn't, you know. But um, life just carried on as it was. I can remember one incident, it might be interesting. When I left school at 14, my first job was making women's shoes. And we was working away one day and a rocket fell. And one of the windows came in and it was very close. It was about 300 yards from the factory I was in. Well, the fella I, that, that taught me the machine I was on, Georgie Isla, his house was at the bottom of Byner Street. So we all rushed out and went down, and it was so amazing. When we got to his house, which was at the corner of the street, his house was in ruins. 
and I thought, poor, he, he says, my mum's in there, and believe it or not, out of all them ruins, out walked his old mum. Amazing. It was really yeah. amazing. They was evil, them doodlebugs and them rockets. They, uh, they were terrible. They were. So start this audio walk at Bethnal Green Tube Station. It's on the central line. At the top of the escalator, turn left and go to the top of the stairs. Look across to your right and you will see the Stairway to Heaven Memorial. This commemorates all those who died on March the 3rd, 1943. You can see a short video about the disaster on the website. One of the best known pubs in Bethnal Green, the Salmon and Ball, is at the junction of Bethnal Green Road and Cambridge Heath Road. During the Huguenot riots of the mid 18th century, two silk weavers were hanged at this spot. These immigrant craftsmen and women were struggling for fairer wages and better conditions. Violence flared, but John Doyle and John Valeen were wrongly accused and executed for crimes they did not commit. Pubs have always been the centre of social life in Bethnal Green. They were lively and popular with local people. Many, however, have closed their doors in recent years, including the Prince of Wales. We moved into a pub just off Cambridge Heath, halfway down Bishop's Way towards Victoria Park. It was called the Prince of Wales, and we moved in there in 1944, just before the end of the war. We had a bomb drop quite close by just before we moved in and we didn't think we had a pub to move into. I was then five years old, so really all my childhood was spent in that pub. I was born in Bow. Dad was a, an engineer at the Bow Common Gas Works, so he hadn't got called up because it was a reserved occupation. But all my mother's family all had pubs in the east end of London, my mother and her sister and her two brothers. So the aim was to get into a pub. I think we borrowed money from Grandma originally to do that. Dad had to keep his job on at the Bow Common Gas Works because it was still wartime and if he'd given that up he'd have got called up. Mum was doing most of the work in the pub while Dad was sort of going backwards and forwards and doing his shifts at the gas works. So that was really, I suppose, quite hard work for them. The clientele were people from just the local terraced houses around there and we had a very big block of flats just opposite. We had a, a factory nearby that made beds, bedding, and we had a big Irish contingent that used to come in from there after work. But basically, yeah, a family, family pub. The story goes in the family that when I was even smaller at my, my grandma's pub in Bow, my mum and dad were helping out over Christmas and they were busy and I was sort of toddling around in the room just off the bar and they were putting all the empty bottles down into this room. But they didn't know, I was toddling over and taking all the little dregs out of the, uh, out of the bottles. <laughs> and they came in and fired around me, rather dozy. And my mother was quite concerned because she didn't know how much I'd had and whether I was going to pass out and should I be taken to the hospital. After a good night's sleep, I was OK. So, yes, it was in my blood at a very early time. <laughs> the East End has strong traditions for producing many boxing champions. York Hall in Old Ford Road was opened in 1929 and regularly staged many national and international contests. I learned to swim at York Hall. I can remember one of my friends, her brother was a boxer and we used to go and watch him boxing there. I can remember going to dances there. I remember my mother saying to my brother and me once when we were in our teens, someone had come and sold a couple of tickets for a dance for some charity, so would we like to go? And we went round there. I had a few dances early on and there was a reporter from the local paper. And he said, look, I don't want to hang around. Can I take your photo now? And then I can get off. So he took a photo of my brother and me. Later on in the evening, a fight broke out there. <laughs> some bottles were smashed, a real East End fight. Uh, my brother said, come on, we're off. We're, we're out of here. So we went home. but. The local paper came out and there was a picture of me and my brother dancing and at the side of it, a report on this bottle fight as if we'd been involved in it. So my mother was not too pleased about that. 
one of the greatest bare-knuckle fighters of the 18th century, Daniel Mendoza, is honoured with a blue plaque on the wall of a house in Paradise Row. As the population expanded in the 19th century, poor families were forced to live in substandard and overcrowded slums and tenement buildings. There was very little sanitation, and disease and illness claimed many lives. Infant mortality was high. The London Chest Hospital was just along from us. And in those days, it was mainly TB cases. I can remember walking past the London Chest Hospital and seeing all the beds out on the balconies because they put them out there to get the fresh air from Victoria Park, really, because it was just on the border of Victoria Park. We lived in a tenement, what they call a tenement. It was a ground floor, first floor, top floor, and each floor was a separate family. And when I was a kid, I don't know how old I was, but soon after the war, they were condemned as slums. They're still there now, and if you bought one, it cost you more or less a quarter of a million pounds. So those slums are now being lived in by people that paid one hell of a lot of money for them. In Wilmot Street, just off Bethnal Green Road, is the Waterloo Estate. These were homes built by the Improved Industrial Dwellings Company and funded by Sir Sidney Waterlow, a Victorian businessman and philanthropist. They were rented out to working class families and had lighting, running water and toilets, a considerable improvement on the slum properties in the area. Children were often excited by the dangers of war. They would collect shrapnel from the shells and bombs which fell on the area and often played in and around the damaged buildings. Never went more than about four or five hundred yards if you were kids when you were playing, unless you went over the park when there was no traffic, mainly horse and carts you had to look out for. So I, I enjoyed living there and I didn't want to move. I was nearly in tears when we decided to move because all my friends were there. They didn't pull the street down, we're going to move you all into the same block, which is what they did later on, evidently. So when they're going to uh, redevelop it, they built the flats first and they moved them with a virtually street from the houses into the flats, so they were all still the same neighbours. During these war years, schools remained open, despite the constant air raids. I went to a school called Wood Close. That was my infant school. Big crowd of kids and we all got on all right. It was a mixed school. Yeah, we were fine. Did you have any particular friends at the time, school friends? I had one particular mate who lived in the same street as me. Actually, he still lives in the same street. Not the same house, but he still lives in the same street. He's lived in that street all his life, in Derbyshire Street. He's lived in it all his life. Food was rationed. There were no luxuries, yet EastEnders could not be denied their favourite dish. Tell me, what was the ingredients of pie and mash? It's minced meat, minced up, pastry on the outside, just ordinary mashed potato, and then the liquor. Now, the liquor was what turned so many people off. Actually, if you looked at it, it looked disgusting. But it was lovely, and it still is lovely. And, and the thing is, people won't eat it because they think it's horrible. And yet, we've introduced people to it over the years, and they can't get enough of it. It's a traditional East End dish, as far as I can remember. Never seen it anywhere else. <laughs> 